Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest version of uh, Tales, Tales from Tales, Outer Tales, Space, Tales, Space, Tales, Space, where I take an HFY story from somewhere around the internet and read it aloud for your enjoyment. All the relevant links are down below. Like, subscribe, and all that YouTube comf to help this video and channel grow. Anyways, as always, I hope that you enjoy. I would just like to thank the following tier 5 patrons and channel members for supporting the channel. Fallen Angel, Buzz Kennington, Data Magnet, and Bob the Dragon. Thank you again, and now on to the story. Story number 1. The Feather Right Incident, written by C-SPAN. People sometimes say that the most dangerous human emotion is anger. They'll tell you stories of humans destroying things in fits of rage and the consequences that follow. Others will tell you that the most dangerous human emotion is hatred, and tell tales of obsessive humans dedicating their lives to making the object of their hatred absolutely miserable. Yet others will insist that the most dangerous human emotion is actually pride, and describe the inane lengths humans will go to in order to satisfy their own vanity. I am here to tell you they're all wrong, and that the most dangerous human emotion is pure, unadulterated glee. Now, many of you are probably thinking that glee seems like a relatively harmless emotion, and surely I must be exaggerating its impact. And in most cases, you would be right. Under normal circumstances, human glee is a wonderful emotion. But I'm not talking about normal human glee. I'm talking about the glee of a human engineer, which is the most frightening thing that I have ever encountered. Because when a human engineer is gleeful, it means that something they built started to work. And that is absolutely terrifying. Gather round, my new friends, and let me tell you a tale of the Feather Right Incident. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of the Feather Right Incident before, but likely through either a history textbook or tales so distorted by the retelling that they're more fiction than fact. But I was there. My friends, I was on the Feather Right, and my tale is the truth. The incident, funny enough, was started partially by me. I was the security officer on board the Feather Right at the time, in part due to my level-headedness during a crisis, but mostly because I massed twice as much as the next largest crewmate and was capable of physically restraining anyone else on board. Not that I needed to. Most incidents about the Feather Right were exactly what you would expect to board a long-haul freighter. Drunken brawls and lovers' quarrels. I know the concept of a long-haul freighter doesn't really exist anymore, but back then you needed someone to keep the peace on journeys that could last months, if not years. Anyways, my role in the incident began with a call down to Engineering Bay to check on a certain Joan Matrovsky. Yes, that Joan Matrovsky. She was just a crew member at the time, of course and I was called down because she was making strange noises and scaring some of the more sensitive engineers. When I arrived in engineering, she seemed to be reaching the end of a fit that had overtaken her, and I was fairly certain that she was laughing. I gently ushered her to the side and asked what was going on. She explained that a major breakthrough had occurred in a project that she had been working on, and that she was simply happy that she had made progress. She then asked to speak to the captain. The look in her face, as some of you have doubtless already guessed, was pure glee. I should have stopped her. I should have known that the slightly manic grin she wore was a harbinger of a great and terrible events that were to come. I should have congratulated her on her achievement denied her to see the captain, and maybe had the ship's doctor check on her for good measure. But I was young, dumb, and overconfident. At the time, I was able to read human emotion well enough to grasp that she was happy. 
And, in my naivety, thought that happy engineer was always a good thing. So I granted a request to see the captain, and tagged along simply because I wanted to hear the conversation the two of them would have. Long haul flights were almost aggressively boring most of the time, and any reason to break my routine was a welcome distraction. Which is why I was on the bridge when Joan excitedly told our captain that she believed she could tweak our engines to get us to our destination much faster. I was really only able to translate Joan's side of the conversation. Our captain communicated through highly directional bursts of pheromones. But the point was, as far as I could tell, that Joan could get us to port in roughly half the time if she had a week to work on the engines. The captain must have agreed, because she thanked them and darted off the bridge wearing a mad grin. I am not able to tell you the mechanics of what she did, and I doubt any of you are capable of understanding anyways. But within a week, Joan's modifications were complete, and she gave the go-ahead to jump. Everyone, Joan included, thought this would simply be a faster jump. So nobody was sedated at the time. I am one of the select group of incredibly unfortunate individuals that has gone through the Matrovsky jump conscious. It was, and will forever be, the worst pain that I have ever felt in my entire life. Every single nerve ending firing at once results in indescribable agony. I've been shot, stabbed, poisoned, and burnt in my time. But none of that even comes close to the pain of a Matrovsky jump. It was a single second that felt like an eternity. After that brief, horrible instant, roughly half of the crew was dead or in need of serious medical attention, and the other half was in serious shock. Fortunately, the ship's doctor was relatively okay, so after a few hours of chaotic triage, everyone on the ship was mostly stable. It was at that point that we began to take our bearings and found out just how magnificently screwed we were. We were well outside the galactic disk, farther than anyone had ever been before. It would take years using a conventional drive technology to reach us, assuming anyone knew where we were. Our only chance of survival was the same experimental drive modification that had gotten us into this mess in the first place. Salvation came in the form of Joe, who was fortunately still alive and capable of coherent thought. If she hadn't been, we all would have died slow deaths of starvation as our food supplies ran out. But fortunately, for everyone still alive on board, she was capable of figuring out what had happened and was able to get us home. Joan needed to decipher what she had done and determine how to tune it so that we would end up in a close vicinity of civilization when we jumped home. She worked like a woman possessed, functioning entirely off catnaps and increasingly stronger stimulants. It took her a month. That month was easily the worst that I had ever spent on any ship. Only a tenuous hope of salvation, as well as the lingering shock of the jump, prevented the crew from tearing each other apart. I think I slept as little as Joan did, trying to maintain some semblance of shipboard discipline. After that terrible month, Joan announced that she was finished, and we prepared to make the return jump. We knew that it would probably kill or cripple some of the remaining crew, but we had no other choice. I imagined it was with a sense of great regret that the captain gave the order to jump. The trip home was worse. On the way out, we were caught entirely off guard by the absolutely agonizing pain, and it obliterated all semblance of rational thought. On the way back, because I was a little better prepared, I retained some awareness of my surroundings. And I saw things, terrible things, beings that lived in the space between dimensions. Fractal geometries and quantum effects made flesh. Beings whom the laws of reality were little more than suggestions. Beings 
that were not pleased by our intrusion into their home, however brief it may have been. The medical and scientific consensus is that anything anyone sees going through the Dmitrovsky jump, conscious, is merely hallucinations caused by misfiring synapses. But I know what I saw. Of the 218 crew members who made the second jump, 46 emerged with the faculties intact. All but one reported seeing something out in the dark, if only for an instant. It is my firm belief that there are things in this universe stranger than we can even comprehend, and it is probably best to leave them well enough alone. Anyways, as I am sure you already know, the Featherite emerged in a dangerously low orbit around a highly populated world. The incident and the incredible technology discovered by it dominated news cycles for weeks. Incidentally, medical workers treated the survivors of the Featherite noticed that the crew members who had been placed in medical comas due to their injuries had sustained no additional damage from the second jump. Further testing confirmed that as long as you were unconscious during the jump, the effects of your psych were minimal. Joan, of course, survived both jumps and proceeded to become tremendously wealthy as a result of her invention. The Featherite incident is remembered as a turning point in interstellar travel and revolutionized transports as we know it. So, in a way, I helped usher in a new era of spaceflight by being an unwitting test pilot for an experimental drive. That's uh, worth a beer or two, right? And remember, if you ever see a gleeful human engineer, run. End of story. Story number two, Diplomatic Chairs, written by Eddie Eddie. Diplomatic meetings in the galactic community are never easy. Each species has unique traditions, traits, and requirements. He can't see Teoluchi on any position that contains the numbers four and seven, because those are the cursed numbers. But you don't want them next to the Zyacha, because they fight like skeevels in a bag. Meals are also a pain. You cannot serve meat as some of the prey races faint at the sight of it. However, some species consider it a delicacy, so you need to uh, hide the meat. Some species' food is toxic to others, so they cannot mix. And then there are the almost unlimited combinations of sauces and other things to be wary of. Cutlery is also a pain. Just one meal takes over eight months of planning. It gets even worse at high council meetings. You can't use a circular table because the Jolna finds circles insulting to be around as there are no defined end, indicating the meeting should go on forever. Well, that means that certain seats need to be considered so specific species and empires don't feel subbed. Seats. Don't even get me started on seats, specific styles, sizes, materials, and even colors. It's insane. Then there's the issue of if the diplomat is bigger or smaller than expected. It was a nightmare. I say it was because of you humans, you blasted humans, and your, uh, what do you call them, sacks of diplomatic communication. Those things saved us so much effort. Just big fabric or plastic sacks full of soft beads. Any species can use them, and even better, the only thing that matters is the size. You can change anything else without much trouble. We've had to start limiting the use of them as people want to use them for personal use. Can you imagine diplomatic thrones being used as common sitting implements? What a pointless waste. Not to mention, having such universal chairs is so useful because no one feels left out. Admittedly, when the Ulian ambassador had to be helped out of his chair, it was funny. Now, can we sort out an order of 40 of the medium-sized ones and uh, 20 large? Uh, what was the slang that you used? Oh, beanbag. End of story. 
And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.